this state of North Carolina is essentially a must-win for Donald Trump, which is why we're really seeing nearly the full contingent of the Trump campaign flood this state in the final days. Of course, you have Donald Trump today, who just started speaking behind me. Mike Pence will be here tomorrow. Trump will return on Monday for a rally, a rally in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Trump campaign calling up some reserves as well today. Uh, a late add, of Melania Trump, to the schedule. She just introduced her husband a, a few minutes ago in a role that we typically do not see her play on the a campaign Trump trail. Here's Melania Trump a short time ago. This nightmare of violence. I have known this man, Donald Trump, for 18 years. Donald is a wonderful husband, father, and grandfather. He's strong, he's determined, bold, and decisive. He's also compassionate, thoughtful, giving, and loving. Donald cares. So a nice moment there for the Trumps. Now, this is the second of, two, of four campaign rallies. Trump will have over four battleground states today. He's off to Nevada and Colorado after this. And today here in North Carolina, this is the last day of in-person early voting. So certainly the Trump campaign trying to make a big push and make sure the people who are here at this rally actually go and actually translate their support here to a vote in the polls. From the moment Donald Trump took an escalator to announce his candidacy, campaign 2016 has escalated into laughs, from awkward air kissing to sniffing, <laughs> to coughing. <coughs> Every time I think about Trump, I get allergic. The Donald's not allergic to kids. He actually signed one, but threatened to reassign a crying baby. Don't worry about that baby. I love babies. A minute later. Actually, I was only kidding. You can get the baby out of here. And then there was mini Trump. Do you want to go back to them or do you want to stay with Donald Trump? Trump. A crowd-pleasing answer till you realize Mini Trump parrots the last word he hears. What's your name? Nay. And then there was the childlike delight in balloons. Hill and Bill batted and kicked them. It seemed like he'd seen balloons for the first time <laughs> in his life. I mean, look at how delighted he is. The Donald seemed delighted with his own pronunciation. Nevada. Nobody says it the other way. It has to be Nevada. Actually, Donald, wrong. This is right. Nevada. At one rally... Hey, get this thing out of here, will you? Trump attacked his teleprompter. He publicly humiliated... Like this stupid mic. His microphone. Stupid mic keeps popping. Remember when Hillary barked into her mic? <laughs> and then this happened at a Trump rally. This is something you shouldn't do. What was that? Is that a dog? Hillary! Uh-oh. <laughs> it's Hillary. When it comes to the insect vote, the Donald attracts mosquitoes. Ooh, there was a mosquito. I don't want mosquitoes around me. And Hillary appeals to flies. Any way he chooses. If only time would fly so we can get relief from the constant buzzing of the candidates. I don't like mosquitoes! Genie Mo, CNN, New York. This is it. We have unfinished business to do. A glass ceiling to crack once and for all. Just two days left until an epic election day showdown. Can you believe it? Days away from the change you've been waiting for your entire life. This is history. From Beyonce and Jay-Z. To Barack and Michelle. They want to bamboozle you. Yeah. Donald Trump is uniquely unqualified yeah. to be president. Clinton bringing in the big guns to try to motivate black and young voters. Will it work? And with Trump closing in on Clinton in key states, could he pull it off? No sidetracks, Donald. Nice and easy. The very latest on where the map stands right now. Plus, the best political minds will be here with insights from the campaign trail. A special edition of State of the Union with limited commercial interruptions starts now. Hello, I'm Dick Tapper in Washington, where the state of our union is down to the wire. Just hours to go now until the American people pick a new president. The stakes are high, so are the tensions, especially perhaps among Democrats who see the race 
tightening in key states. Hillary Clinton's campaign has been banking on a blue wall. Die-hard Democratic state she was banking on for a victory, but Donald Trump says, not so fast. We're going into what they used to call Democrat strongholds, where we're now either tied or leading. We're going to Minnesota. We're going up to Minnesota, which traditionally has not been Republican at all. And we're doing phenomenally. We just saw a poll. Minnesota, a state that has not gone red in a presidential contest since the Nixon landslide of 1972. And now Trump and his running mate Mike Pence are both going to be there today and tomorrow in these precious last few hours. So does Trump know something that the rest of us don't? Or is this wishful, perhaps even desperate, electoral map thinking? Minnesota's Democratic Senator Al Franken joins us now. Senator Franken, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, Jake. So let's start with your home state of Minnesota. Donald Trump is headed there today, Pence tomorrow. Republicans say they're within striking distance. Is Hillary Clinton at risk of losing your state, which has not gone Republican since 72? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, I'm, Jake, kind of the poster boy for close elections. I had a very close election here in Minnesota in 2008, um, won by 312 votes. So what I've been focused on the last, actually, couple months is on turnout, especially last month, uh, doing canvassing all over the country or, or talking to canvassing offices, uh, urging peop uh, our people to get on the doors. I think we have a great ground game. I've been, uh, and I'm spending this last week in Minnesota doing that. Let's turn to uh, another uh, traditionally blue state in presidential contests, Michigan. Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, all campaigning there in the final stretch before the election. It's a state that was once thought to be safely in the Democratic column this year. Is Hillary Clinton at risk of losing this Democratic firewall of states such as Michigan? Again, I'm not uh, a pundit. Uh, what I do know is that I've been for Hillary this whole time, all along. She's the smartest, hardest working, uh, toughest person I know. I think she would be great as president. You know, Jake, when a decision comes to the president, it's because only the president can make that decision. And uh, the president has to draw on his, uh, and I believe soon her, uh, all, all her past experience and and uh, knowledge and I want her doing that and I, I don't trust uh, Donald Trump uh, because I don't think he has any really depth or breadth of, of knowledge about any, uh, public policy anyway. There are a lot of Democrats out there who are nervous, who are anxious. Are you among them? Oh sure. I'm always nervous. I was nervous in 12. I was nervous in 8. For good reason, I won by 10 and 12 votes. But I mean, um, I, uh, you know, w w we run through the finish line. This is what I tell everybody uh, that I, I, I go to canvassing centers. I say, uh, many of you have jobs, many of you have families. Ignore them, get on the doors. <laughs> I want to ask you about this new two-minute ad that the Trump campaign is going to be airing. Uh, it bla it um, blasts the Washington and global establishment. It uses images of Obama and Clinton, but, but some columnists have noted that there are three other individuals uh, in the ad. George Soros, Janet Yellen, Lloyd Blankfein, the financier, the Fed chair, and the chair of Goldman Sachs. And people have pointed out all three of them happen to be Jewish. What was your take when you saw the ad? Well, when I saw the ad, I thought that this was uh, something of a German shepherd whistle, uh, a dog whistle, uh, to sort of the uh, a certain group in the United States. I, I think I'm Jewish, so maybe I'm, I'm sensitive to it, but it clearly had sort of elders of Zion kind of feel to it, international banking crisis. Uh, 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 plot or conspiracy rather and uh, and then a number of Jews uh, so I, I think that um, that's it, it does speak to a certain 
uh, part of his uh, alt-right base. The Bannon, I mean Bannon, who's head of Breitbart, is his is, uh, chairman. Uh, they traffic in that. Uh, Trump has retweeted a lot of that sort of thing, and I think that it's it's a uh, an appeal to some of the worst elements in our country as a closing argument. And I think that people who aren't sensitive to that or don't know that history may not see that in that, but that's what I, I, I immediately uh, saw. I want to ask you about um, this news uh, broken by Reuters that the Clinton Foundation confirmed that it did accept a $1 million gift from Qatar while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State without informing the State Department, even though they had uh, made uh, that uh, as an assertion of rules that they would inform the State Department. Do you think going forward, if Hillary Clinton wins on Tuesday, does the Clinton Foundation need to be shut down, completely shut down, so as to eliminate any possible conflicts of interest or appearances of, of, of influence peddling? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, Cutter, we have a base in Cutter. Um, I mean, people should remember that. I mean, I've been uh, on a number of USO tours before I became senator uh, to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and I know that Qatar is very important in our our uh, uh, presence in the region. Uh, the Clinton Foundation has saved millions of lives. Um, I think that sometimes people should uh, compare the two foundations, the Trump Foundation and the Clinton Foundation, which uh, got the HIV uh, drugs to millions of people versus the Trump Foundation, which doesn't seem to have done much of anything for anybody. I, I hear you, Donald sir, but, but is, it, is it not, I mean, the idea that there is this foundation that is the, the, the Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea Clinton Foundation out there raising tens of millions of dollars um, while she is potentially president of the United States, doesn't that create a possible real problem for her that's not worth undermining her presidency? There are questions about when individuals, groups, oh, sure, countries, sure. corporations no, I, give I, money. No, no, I take your point and, uh, you know, maybe there's some way to uh, to continue the good work that the foundation does and do it under uh, a completely uh, different, uh, uh, you know, different people running it so that there is no conflict of interest. I, I think that needs clearly to be looked at and I'm sure that uh, I, I can't see them uh, not responding to that critique and uh, finding a way to completely divorce that from from her. That's a good idea, I think. Hillary Clinton was asked this week about FBI Director James Comey and whether she, if she wins, would ask him to resign. Take a listen. I'm not going to, you know, get ahead of myself by assuming I'll be fortunate enough to be elected. I also would never comment on any kind of, you know, personnel issue. As as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, do you have an opinion as to whether or not you have confidence in the prospect of FBI Director Comey moving forward, overseeing the email investigation, and any possible inquiries into the Clinton Foundation? I, I think what's troubling that we've heard out of the FBI, I think it was troubling that he uh, put that vague letter out 11 days before the election. I think even more troubling is what we've heard from sort of the rogue elements within the FBI seemingly uh, tipping off uh, former Mayor Giuliani that something was up and also, I mean, they just seem like that's not the FBI, that's not what the FBI is supposed to do, it seems. So I, I'm on the Judiciary Committee, I'm sure we will have hearings, I'm sure that uh, uh, FBI uh, Director Comey will be before us, and I, I think he, he should answer questions about this, and he should be able to control the FBI. He's director of the FBI. He should be able to. Uh, the, what's been happening there uh, is been a little hinky, I think. But uh, as you know, so FBI we'll, we'll be directors. Questions. 
Yeah, FBI directors uh, are basically appointed for 10, 10 year terms. He served three. Right. Do you have confidence that he can he can continue in that job for the next seven years if Hillary Clinton wins? I, I think we're going to have hearings. I think we're try going to try to get to uh, the bottom of this sort of rogue element within the FBI that seems to think it's okay to go outside uh, the FBI to be uh, trying to affect the election that seems to be responding to just scurrilous uh, right-wing books and uh, <laughs> starting investigations based on on that kind of uh, you know the, that kind of propaganda that we've we've seen before that that's disturbing and if you're director of the FBI you should be able to uh, prevent that from happening that's part of being the leading an organization is to keep that organization on its mission and this is so uh, apart and separate from anything they've ever done before that they're, they're very very um, important questions to be asking director comey so you're gonna you're calling for hearings uh, to, to, to talk to director comey about these what you call rogue elements in the fbi yeah uh, i think that there should be hearings uh, and uh, and I, I I'm, I'm certain there will be hearings uh, in in the Judiciary Committee on, on this matter. Let me ask you about uh, the election going forward. There are signs that Latino early voting is up significantly, but that African American early voting, especially in several key states like like North Carolina, is down. Are you concerned about what this might mean for Hillary Clinton on Tuesday? Uh, well, uh, on the African-American vote in North Carolina, I think that we've seen in the last week there has been an effort to suppress that vote. Um, and I think uh, African-American North Carolinians uh, have gotten that message. And uh, the reaction to that usually is, uh, is increased turnout. So um, I think that their effort to suppress people, to, to purge uh, the roles. Remember, the president told about this 100-year-old woman who was purged and wrote him a letter and uh, that went to a judge who called this insane, what was going on. I think that's going to actually spur uh, African Americans in North Carolina to turn out. Senator Al Franken of the great state of Minnesota, we appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Jake. Always, always good to talk to you. Nice talking to you, sir. Donald Trump is keeping up a relentless schedule, hitting several time zones a day to maximize his remaining hours. But he faced a frightening moment in Reno, Nevada last night as Secret Service rushed Trump off the stage and security forces stormed the audience after panic in the crowd. Now, what we've learned is what apparently happened is a protester tried to raise a Republicans against Trump sign. That protester was confronted by people in the crowd, tackled, and someone in the crowd apparently incorrectly yelled that the protester had a gun. The U.S. Secret Service says that no weapon was found. They report that no one was hurt. Mr. Trump returned to the stage not long after and resumed his campaign pitch. Joining me now from New York is Trump campaign manager Kellyanne Conway. Kellyanne, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Jake. Hi. So first of all, we're glad everyone's okay. I have to ask, your social media director, Dan Scavino, and a member of Mr. Trump's family, they're retweeting misinformation that this was an assassination attempt. It, it was not an assassination attempt. Thankfully, should they be spreading this min misinformation? Well, I'm glad you're happy that everybody's okay. That's really the main focus here. Um, it's scary. I mean, all the coverage is usually about our protesters wreaking havoc and making people feel afraid, and this certainly goes both ways. I'm with Mr. Trump and the Secret Service routinely. They do an amazing job. They are absolutely the unsung heroes, I'm sure, for Mrs. Clinton as well and the Secret Service. Um, we really respect those men and women enormously. And I'm glad nobody was hurt, but it does remind you that in these closing days, especially as the polls tighten, men 
many of us are getting more death threats, getting more um, angry messages on social media and elsewhere. And it's a, you know, it's a pretty fraught environment there. I think that's the real focus here. I also just want to point out, because some people are, are spreading misinformation about the protester, he had canvassed for Hillary Clinton and he had donated to her campaign. So this is a Democratic plant or operative um, trying to disrupt our rally. And I think that people saw a nimble, resilient Donald Trump, who would be nimble and resilient as president as well, take back to the stage, Dan Scavino telling mm -hmm. people, we're not going to be stopped, nobody can interrupt this movement. But, you know, if you're Don Jr. Right. and you're he, on a live TV set while you're watching this unfold, it's pretty rattling to think of what may have happened to your father. So I'll excuse him that. Except it wasn't an assassination attempt. It was a, a, apparently a, a, a local voter, a Republican, uh, who says he is supporting Hillary Clinton, he, he has given money to Hillary Clinton, he has canvassed for Hillary Clinton, yes. but he says he's a, a Republican, but most importantly, he was not trying to assassinate anyone. Uh, and I, I, here's what I'm talking about, let's put it up, Donald Trump Jr. and Dan Scavino retweeted this, quote, Hillary ran away from rain today, Trump is back on stage minutes after assassination attempt. Again, we're very happy that this was not an assassination attempt, but why is your campaign spreading that it was? Well, how do you, first of all, that's really remarkable, I have to say, that that's what the storyline is here. Um, I thank you for reminding everybody that the, the rain chased her away. There weren't a lot of people there at her rally to begin with, and the rain just let them running for cover. I think she's got to sort of travel nonstop with Beyonce, Jay-Z, and the likes of that, just to prop her up and get a decent crowd. People, by the way, are there to see Beyonce, not to see her. Um, and, you know, Jake, I want to say, are CNN going to retract all the storylines, all the headlines, all the breathless predictions of the last two weeks that it turned out not to be true? The race is over. The path is closed. It's going to be a blowout. You guys retract that, and I'll give a call to Dan Scavino about the retweet. I never reported anything along those lines. I've always been saying that this was going to be a tight election, has. and even when Hillary Clinton... Who hasn't? CNN certainly has. CNN certainly has. You know, I love CNN, but you got to you got to be honest here. The lower third, what's always on the chirons, the panelists, the so-called experts, constantly saying she can't lose. The race is over. The path is narrowed. And you know what? I actually thank you guys in part I've for never, that. I've never heard anybody time, say. I've, I've never heard anybody say the race CNN? is over. We've been saying all along that Donald wow. Trump has a path to the presidency, and she. Uh, you, you can say wow all you want. I've never said that the race was over. We can replay it as many tapes as you want. Let's move okay. on. I want to play well, something that was said on Sunday at that same rally by the chairman of the Nevada Republican Party, Republican Party Michael McDonald, and by your candidate, Donald Trump. Take a listen. Last night in Clark County, they kept a poll open till 10 o'clock at night. So a certain group could vote. It wasn't in an area that normally has high transition. The polls are supposed to close at 7. This was kept open until 10. It's being reported that certain key Democratic polling locations in Clark County were kept open for hours and hours beyond closing time to bus and bring Democratic voters in. Folks, it's a rigged system. Uh, Kellyanne, a spokesperson for Clark County, Nevada, said that folks who were in line before the polls closed were allowed to stay in line and vote. I'm sure you know that that's a common practice throughout the country. Um, if a whole bunch of Trump voters are in line when the polls close in Ohio, should they not be allowed to vote, or would you want the polls closed uh, only after every single one of them in line at the closing time was allowed to vote? We just always want the law followed and the rules followed, and I do predict that you're going to see uh, really long lines, serpentine-like lines on Tuesday of folks there for Donald Trump. You're going to see record turnout in many of these places. But it, look, it's concerning when you, you hear reports about special favors and perhaps special rules for Democratic voters. We already know that the, the, their presidential nominee Wait, the has special, special rule? rules for what's her. This, well, What's this? I don't understand. That we got if people are in of line, that. if people are in line when the when the polls close, they the people who are in line at that cutoff time are traditionally and in some places by law right. allowed to vote. You want that to happen on Tuesday right. with Trump voters? That's what Clark County I was sure reportedly do. doing if, with 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 maybe. other voters. Yeah. Uh, 
So, so I, I don't understand the to Well, we've not been able, we've not been able to independently verify that. But I'm telling you that we just want the rules and the law followed, and that'll be fine. But you know, excuse us that the Democratic presidential nominee is somebody who lives with, under a separate set of rules than the rest of us. That's very clear. She gets to set up private email servers and lie about it and flout yeah, the law and, and I'm, compromise I'm your kids about. and my kids' national security. Well, but that's what the voters are focused on too. You know, we have a report this morning that she has her maid, one of her housekeepers printing out classified information who is this person who is so selfish I don't know what so report I don't know what report I don't know what reporting you for but my, my question is if voters are in line at a cutoff time and and the county says you're in you're in line at seven o'clock therefore we're gonna wait until everybody in line at this cutoff point can vote what's the problem if if that is true if that is true there isn't a problem but we don't know that that's true and we'll and we'll all take a look at Tuesday as well but yes we just want the rules and the law followed but remember the democratic party well, Mr. Chose Trump to said clear it was the rigged field, and he's saying he's been saying that the system is rigged for a long time and apparently no, but he was talking specifically apparently, about you, you don't have the information Mr. Trump is saying that the system is rigged with these voters who are american citizens voting and i'm just trying to figure out why that's a problem, why that's an example of people, of anything being rigged. People are allowed to exercise the right to vote as long as they're in time at the cutoff point. Right. Jake, on that, we agree. Now, we've now said it four times because I'm sure it's a better storyline to discuss than the tightening polls and the fact that we're playing follow the leader and Hillary Clinton is following us to Michigan, following us to Pennsylvania, following us to Wisconsin, following us to New Hampshire, all these blue states on her schedule now for an arrogant campaign that's built, that's booked fireworks. Um, in New York to celebrate her victory on Tuesday night. She's got the President of the United States running around to blue states that he carried twice just to prop her up. That's actually the big story this morning, but if we want to say for the fourth time and agree together for the fourth time that if, big, big conditional word, if the law is being followed and people are in line, they ought to be able to vote. Donald Trump's been talking about a rigged system all along. You know, his poll numbers started to tighten right after that third debate, and part of it was him talking about a rigged corrupt system where people just can't get a break. He's the voice for the forgotten man, forgotten woman. And since then, we've seen the polls continue to tighten to the point where we're deploying our two best assets, Mr. Trump and Governor Pence, in traditionally blue states that Barack Obama carried twice with well more than 50% of the vote, a number Hillary <coughs> Clinton hasn't seen all along. Why is this woman who starts out with 248 electoral votes unable to find 22 more? I mean, it's absolutely confounding. She just can't find the extra 22. It's She's a very competitive race. Votes. Very competitive race, and we've well, we been covering it that uh, way. the fact we see it that, that way. That's, we've, yeah. we've been covering it that way, and we led the show with a senator from Minnesota to talk about the fact that Mr. Trump is going into we Minnesota. He sounded very today worried, by the way. He said he was worried. Your campaign's created a he final two-minute closing ad. I want I want you to take a listen to part of it. Our movement is about replacing a failed and corrupt political establishment with a new government controlled by you, the American people. The establishment has trillions of dollars at stake in this election. The populist message it takes on Wall Street. Can you tell me one policy that Donald Trump would enact that Goldman Sachs will not like? Uh, he pro they, he pro they probably would not like the fact that um, he is going to renegotiate trade deals and bring jobs back from China and Mexico, make uh, Americans keep American jobs here. I, I can't imagine that, you know, that a lot of people in on Wall Street appreciate that. They seem to like the way the policies have been going more recently. Um, and why would Goldman Sachs not? Why would Goldman Sachs not? Why would I mean Goldman Sachs? Why would why would they be against uh, uh, trade deals to benefit the American worker? Well, they don't, they don't necessarily benefit Goldman Sachs, but I think more to the point, when you go back and look at TARP, which we got from a Republican president and it was uh, continued by a Democratic president, Donald Trump would not be for that, and that benefits all these big banks who don't didn't need the help. And in some cases, were forced to take the money uh, because the government. Yeah, that was 2007, to. 2008 legislation. That was that yeah, was legislation from, that from eight years ago, but. Right. Well, you guys Trump's always policies, want to talk about the Iraq Trump's war, policies, which was five years before that. Right. Look, but, he's but trying to simulate about, like, energy investment. Is Goldman Sachs? Does Goldman Sachs agree? And Goldman Sachs is a big place, so let's not, you know, let's not make this an overwrought question and answer. But does Goldman Sachs want the kind of energy independence that Donald Trump wants, so that we stop relying upon 
uh, foreign sources of oil and we start unleashing the energy that's off of our shores and under our feet right here in the U.S., spur economic growth within our communities, uh, do the hydraulic fract fracturing that's unleashing the natural gas that we have right here. Uh, you know, are they, know. so there, there are many different, po well, well, there you go. Well, there's an answer. In other words, let's ask them. But the fact is, but that's not a, is a tool but that's a, but of the Golden big banks Sachs that gave her. And I'll tell you one of my things he wouldn't do. The one more thing he mm -hmm. would do, he wouldn't take gazillions of dollars in speaking fees from big banks and then pretend that somehow he's going to regulate them or somehow he's going to be for the people. I mean, if Hillary Clinton were a legitimate, we have no idea what he's taking in speaking against fees. Wall Street. Donald Trump has given speeches for Street. money. He has given speeches for money, but we have no idea how much money because he refuses to release his tax returns. Well, Hillary that's Clinton, as CNN has reported, Hillary Clinton has made tens of millions of dollars on speeches and she gives them for free now and yep. nobody seems to want to show up and listen to them. So, I mean, her crowds look like we know that she's given, like she's we know that she's made that money lecture. because she's released her tax returns. We know that she's made that money because she's released no, her tax know, returns. No, we know she's no, we know she's made that money because the Clintons are all about money and the, the, we just got confirmation that a million dollar gift from Cutter for Bill Clinton's birthday. Look, Americans look at that and they say, "Last time I celebrated my husband's birthday, no foreign government gave us a million dollars." Nobody said in emails, "We want to make sure that Bill Clinton Inc makes about 66 million." That's a lot of money. Uh, 28 million from Morocco. I mean, this is just not normal. And by the way, Americans, it's not necessary. You don't have to start the next four years under a cloud of corruption and unanswered questions by grifting and gifting among people who always put themselves first. I mean, if that weren't true, there's Jake, a lot of unanswered American questions about. I, I yeah, I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions about Donald Trump because he doesn't refuse, release his tax returns. He has given speeches for money. You We're told that he, we, we, have no idea, we have no idea what they are because he won't be transparent with the American people about what his, yeah, where his money is or where he's there's taking money from. He's very transparent. Here's what Americans should look at when they see, here's what they should see when they look at Donald Trump. 104 page financial disclosure form. Everybody can pull it up right now. The first major the party candidate coffee. to not release tax returns and since 1976. Well, he's the first major party candidate to truly be outside of politics, and that's what people see. He's built a movement. Everywhere he shows, he's like five stops yesterday, everywhere he shows there's just thousands and thousands of people there in these so-called blue states. But we're, we're supposed to, and then the media ask, but will they vote? No, they just stood in line for five hours to go to a rally, 15,000 strong, but they're not going to show up on Tuesday. We know momentum and enthusiasm matter, and we know when people see Donald Trump, they see somebody who's a job creator, a builder, a problem solver, a fixer, somebody who's got vision, and goes to Washington, Jake, owing nobody anything, and certainly hasn't. I can guarantee you his tax returns don't show millions of dollars from foreign governments giving to his family's foundation. We All have no idea what they show because he won't criticized. release them. Well, you can't well, we guarantee know, that because you have no FBI idea what they show because he won't release his tax returns. He won't release Is his tax returns, so you can't guarantee anything. Is, Is he, he under, under FBI, FBI investigation? investigation? Did he ask yeah. his housekeeper to print out uh, national security classified emails? I mean, I'm, this woman I know has that no are, respect I know that for there the are invest I know that there are investigations by the New York Attorney General into Trump University. I know that there's a court case involving Trump University. I know there's plenty of things that uh, Mr. Trump uh, has not answered questions on. I want to ask you, Mr. Trump is asking the American people to make him commander-in-chief on Tuesday, just 48 hours from now. I want to show you what Mr. Trump said on Saturday about U.S. military commanders participating in the Iraqi effort to recapture Mosul from ISIS. Take a listen. Whatever happened to the element of surprise? Uh, the element of surprise. What a group of losers we have. How is Mr. Trump going to be able well, to work uh, with the members of Central Command and U.S. military leaders if he's been calling them a group of losers? No, he's basically referring to the current Commander-in-Chief and his former Secretary of State when he says that. He made that very clear in the debates as well. His problem is that you got a Commander-in-Chief and you've got his former Secretary of State, who just happens to want to be the next Commander-in-Chief, having an awful record, according to Mosul, an awful record on the, on the Syrian fake red lines, the Russian reset, the Middle East, um, Northern Africa several years ago with what was supposed to be a great Arab Spring. Uh, they own, you know, they own all these hot spots around the globe. And, and people ought to know that. They ought to see not what people say, but what they've done. And in the case of Hillary Clinton and her former boss, Barack Obama, that has not gone well, Jake. I don't think anybody can dispute that. If, if people thought their foreign policy and national security records were so great, he, she would be running away with this. She would say, look, I've been there. I was in the room. 
I made these tough decisions. I was I was Secretary of State. Therefore, I'm ready to be Commander in Chief. Why is she tied among vet? Why is he winning among veteran households, military households so handily? He's beating her by double digits because people don't trust her to be Commander in Chief. They think she's disqualified herself. She's unfit because she okay. runs around with confidential information on some pervert server, having her maid printed out. I mean, this is somebody who's totally disqualified herself from being Commander in Chief based on her own actions. All right, Kellyanne Conway, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Good luck on Tuesday. With the race, race this close, both Clinton and Trump campaign officials are worried about the effect that third-party candidates might have on the ballots, concerned that they could sway victory in tight battleground states such as New Hampshire. The latest CNN poll of polls nationally shows the Libertarian candidate Gary Johnson and his running mate Bill Weld with 4% of the vote, and Green Party candidate Jill Stein with 2%, enough to prompt President Obama to issue this stark warning. Anybody sitting on the sidelines right now or uh, deciding uh, to engage in a protest vote, that's a vote for Trump. Here to respond is one half of the Libertarian Party ticket, Gar uh, Bill Weld, Gary Johnson's running mate, uh, former governor of Massachusetts. Governor Weld, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jake. Pleasure. So you've said a lot of nice things about Hillary Clinton and li lately, and you've made it clear that you consider Donald Trump a clear and present danger to the nation. I know you want the Libertarian Party to get that 5% it needs in order to go forward and continue to be a thriving American political party. But I have to say, sometimes it sounds like you want to endorse Clinton. Is that, am I reading you wrong? Well, you're correct, Jake, that I do want the Libertarian Party to get over 5% uh, in, in the vote because that would give the Libertarian Party a permanent seat at the table in our ongoing national political dialogue. And I do think one of the issues in this campaign has been, do you like the uh, two-party monopoly, the R Party and the D Party, in Washington, D.C.? We don't like that monopoly. That's the monopoly that kept us out of the debates and, you know, deprived us of the chance to, uh, to run the table. Having said all of that, uh, I do see a big difference between the two other candidates, Mr. Trump and Mrs. Clinton. I do think that Mr. Trump, with all deference, is totally unfit uh, to be president of the United States. I don't think he has the stability to... He has the temperament to... Um, deal with all the many, many stakeholders at home and abroad that any president is going to have to do it. And, you know, I think it's a measure of how much our politics has sunk this year that when I say anything even faintly civil about uh, Mrs. Clinton, you know, there are shrieks of uh, outrage. How could he say that? Doesn't he realize that she's the enemy because she's on another ticket? Well, she's not the enemy. She's a perfectly reputable, professional, responsible candidate for president of the United States and deserves to be treated as such. I, it's just an odd position you're in, I guess, because you're on one of the tickets and yet you're saying something nice and like you, you're reality based. You know that Gary Johnson is not going to be the next president of the United States. You're not going to be the next vice president of the United States. And in, in some ways it might seem to, to some critics that you're trying to have it both ways, not endorsing Clinton, but you want no responsibility if, if you and Governor Johnson tip the election in any way to Donald Trump. Am I being unfair? Well, I, 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 am, I am on the ticket, and tens of thousands of people in the libertarian ranks have worked very hard to try to get us to this point, uh, which is a high point to date uh, for the Libertarian Party. You never know where a vote is coming from. My belief is that the Libertarian Party uh, pulls substantially more from Mr. Trump uh, than from Mrs. Clinton. I I'm well aware there was an earlier uh, media boomlet for the idea that, oh no, all our voters were millennials and we were pulling millennials from Mrs. Clinton. That's, that's not my understanding of what the detailed uh, polling shows. But, uh, you know, we've got a perfect right to try to uh, draw our vote just as everyone else does. Uh, but I have made uh, plain uh, my view uh, of the two candidates and and frankly I think uh, you know Mrs. Clinton uh, recently has uh, been receiving a pretty raw deal from people trying to fan the flames that there's some huge uh, FBI uh, new investigation of her email server and you know there are obviously Republican members of Congress uh, who are in that hunt it does appear that there may be uh, some disgruntled uh, FBI agents who, who appear to think that somehow they've been cheated of their prey 
Uh, that's not how the system is supposed to work. And, and I think Jim Comey is a real good guy, real good reputation in the Justice Department uh, for a long time, but I do think he made a mistake sending that uh, letter to Congress, which is essentially the equivalent of a press release, uh, not quite saying we're reopening the investigation, because that was not done, but certainly fanning the flames and jumping into the middle of a presidential uh, election with 10 or 11 days to go. That's not what the FBI is supposed to be all about. And it, it was a just... A, a 180 degree violation of long-standing uh, practice and principles of the Justice Department. Well, Governor, are you saying that you think that the FBI director should step down or should resign? No, 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 I'm not saying that. And, uh, you know, I think one thing that's happened, everyone is so anxious because this is such a, uh, a watershed election. It's a conscience uh, election. Everyone's going to remember who they voted for this year. I think the stakes are, are so high because the, the, the standing of the, of the two uh, major candidates is so so disparate. It'll be like, you know, everyone remembers where they were when they heard about 9-11. Everyone who is old enough remembers where they were when President Kennedy was shot. I think people are going to look back uh, on this uh, election and uh, really reflect on the vote that they took. And I, I think it's a year when people have to think for themselves and cast a, cast a vote of conscience. Let me ask you about the state of New Hampshire. You're from neighboring uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Take a look at this poll from WBUR TV. It shows Trump 40 percent, Clinton 39 percent, Johnson Weld 10 percent. So you are having an impact on who might win that key battleground state in New Hampshire in those four crucial electoral votes. Are you comfortable with the fact that support for you might tip New Hampshire and thus the presidency to? one of the candidates and since you are not not comfortable with donald trump what if it is tipping it towards donald trump well that's in a way conjectural uh, but the answer is yeah i am comfortable with us uh uh, pursuing uh, the best we can get as a libertarian ticket. You know, I remind uh, you and the audience that uh, we are fiscally responsible and socially inclusive. We think that's the best combination of positions, and it's one reason why I do think it's important uh, to have the libertarians have a seat at that table in Washington. It's not like we would be a threat to the stability of the republic. We don't have a parliamentary system. We have a, uh, a fixed-term system in the United States, so you're not going to have an inability because of extra parties uh, to get uh, to a decision on, on the presidency. But I think, we, I think the Republican Party has a lot to learn from us about being socially inclusive. I think the Democratic Party has a lot to learn from us about being fiscally responsible and, and uh, balancing the budget, which we have pledged to do in our first uh, 100 days. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it'd be a long, cool drink of water for Washington to have us there, so I don't feel at all apologetic about us trying to get All right. There. Governor Weld, good luck on Tuesday. Thank you so much, sir. Donald Trump's last Thank bid, you, last minute bid for Minnesota, along with heavy campaigning in Michigan, has many Democrats taking a second look at their traditional blue wall of electoral votes, which is why President Bill Clinton is campaigning there today, followed by Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama tomorrow. So is the blue wall crumbling like blue cheese? CNN's David Chalian is at the magic wall with all the very latest. David? Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. This is the heart of Hillary Clinton's electoral map advantage. Take a look at the most recent poll we've seen out of Michigan. 42% to 38%. That's a four-point race in a state where Barack Obama beat Mitt Romney by nine points. This is too close for comfort for the Democrats. That's why you see so much campaign activity there. Also, out last night, a brand new Des Moines Register poll in Iowa, 46% to 39%, a seven-point lead for Donald Trump in Iowa. This causes concern not so much about Iowa, which the Clinton folks already thought was out of reach, but what else is happening around Iowa if that is happening in Iowa? Let's go to the electoral map and look at the path to 270. This is the, the current battleground map. Hillary Clinton at 268, only two shy of 270. Where does she go to find it? Well. They feel pretty good about Nevada. They think the early vote there is really good. That gets her over to 274. But this is what's critical. If Donald Trump is able to dig into a place like Michigan, look at that. It drops Hillary Clinton down to 258. Where does she go to find the rest? She must get a big battleground prize like a Florida or a North Carolina. That would do it to get her back over, over 270. But that is going to require some work. That is why you see Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton heading to Michigan in the final days. They need to keep fortifying that blue wall. Jake? 
So just how worried should Democrats be? With me here, our panel, CNN Chief Political Correspondent Dan Abash, RNC Communications Director and Chief Strategist Sean Spicer, former Democratic Governor of Michigan Jennifer Granholm, CNN Political Commentators Van Jones and Alice Stewart, and we're going to bring back CNN Political Director David Chalian. Governor, I'm starting with you. Start. What's going on in Michigan? Is Hillary Clinton going to be able to pull it out? It sounds like it's really tight. Barack uh, Obama's going there, so obviously they're nervous. I know. It's awesome. It's awesome. I mean, usually <laughs> Michigan is like, you know, <laughs> It's totally great. It's Everybody awesome. on the ground it's is awesome so excited. It's awesome that the president has to be deployed to Michigan. <laughs> no, it's just, I agree. It's awesome. We, we love all of the attention. We really do. But here's what I would say is that a lot of what has not been covered is that Michigan has early absentee voting. And in that early absentee vote, Democrats have banked 50,000 absentee votes, meaning they're over what the Republicans have. In fact, the number of absentee votes that we are seeing right now is well over what it was in 2020. 12 for Democrats. So we're feeling good about that bank. And um, we also know that, you know, election day is going to be key. So I, I would say one other thing that I think it's important to realize, Michigan's demographics are, are very interesting because you do have a large Arab American population and you do have a significant Latino population as well. So when you combine African American, Latino, uh, Arab American and women and millennials, the millennial vote for the even in early is up, we're, we're encouraged. Well, Sean, I, I wouldn't it, want to put my money in that bank. Well, let me, let me <laughs> I'll tell you what's, right, what's going on here. Let's think about right now, man. Okay, right now. Right now. <laughs> Governor, since 1988, a Republican hasn't carried Michigan. The idea that you're deploying the President of the United States 48 hours from an election to go to Michigan says that that blue wall has cracked well, big time. Iowa hasn't been carried, was carried twice by Obama. Seven point lead, according to the Des Moines Register. But, but state Trump after state. Trump is not ahead in Michigan. Trump it, it, has not been ahead in then Michigan. Then why in, you're in wasting the President of the United States' time then? Tell him to go somewhere else. Dana, why is the president going to Michigan? Because, this, maybe because Democrats shopping. in Michigan who are not on television when they don't have to, to be, with all due respect, uh, to be very positive, positive yeah. are saying, and I talked to some yesterday, that they're very worried. That they're very worried because it is narrow and they don't want to take any chances. Well, and that's, that's for sure. You don't want to take yeah. any speaking chances. Of, speaking of awesome, to the governor's point, what's really awesome is two weeks ago, Hillary Clinton was leading in Michigan by 13 points. Slowly it's gone from 8 to 6 to 5. Now she's only 4 points ahead in a state where Democrats have won that since 1988. And, speaking of on the air, Hillary's putting $2 million on the air in Michigan. That that, in addition to President Obama being there, they're worried. What's going on? Beds are <laughs> damp. In <laughs> well, the beds. You're saying Democrats are wetting in their beds. In general. Uh, 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 hey, but look, that's a four-point uh, lead. Uh, that's too, that's uh, within uh, the margin of error. That's uh, scary uh, for uh, Democrats. Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. There is a crack in the blue wall, and it has to do with trade. This is this is the ghost of Bernie Sanders. Yep. There is there is a discontent with some Democratic voters over trade, and some blame Hillary Clinton. And so you've got to go back there and and, and shore back up. But here's the reality: there is a, a clear case to be made, and is being made by Democrats to come to stay home, come here. Listen, you don't like where the bus is going. You don't let a drunk guy drive the bus to to solve the problem. But but listen, we, there's no point pretending that there, there's not some some some, some concern here. And, and let's, David, let me just let me just let me just say. It makes sense that if there is concern mm -hmm. that white working class voters who are supporting Trump overwhelmingly in Iowa and Ohio, two states where Donald Trump is favored, are really surging and really showing him strong support, why wouldn't they show up in Michigan? That's right. And I also think this speaks, and Sean probably can speak more to this than anybody else at the table here, but to the power of big data right now, because what is happening is, and this is both sides, right? I mean, Robbie Mook said Michigan is tightening. He sees it. Uh, Robbie the, Mook, the Clinton campaign manager. The Clinton campaign manager. The Republicans have absolutely, on the Trump data side, also seen Michigan as a target closing at the end. And what you can do when you have all this data coming in, make these last minute exactly. decisions. That's why in the final week, Bill Clinton twice, Hillary Clinton twice, Barack Obama once. That kind of firepower would not be sent to Michigan no unless everybody no, was seeing no, no, there's, And there's no question that the polls have been tightening. I don't want to be, you know, completely Pollyanna about it. But I would say to your point, Van, in that very poll that you described where she's four points up, she gets better marks on trade than he does by four points because people have seen what she has said. Bernie Sanders has been there campaigning for her, and she really has been very clear about wanting to renegotiate. Napoli. While we're talking about while we're talking about Bernie Sanders, I want to bring in this uh, 
this uh, uh, this tape of a student introducing Bernie Sanders, I believe it was in, in Iowa uh, on November 5th, uh, and he actually has to be escorted off the stage by Clinton's Iowa communications director. Take a look. She is so trapped in the world of the elite that she has completely lost grip of what it's like to be an average person. She doesn't care. Voting for another lesser of two females, there's no point. Oops. Got the millennial vote all locked up, huh? <laughs> Oops. Listen, um, <laughs> that Everything wasn't good. Awesome. That wasn't good, and you can't spin that. But here's but here's the reality. Um, you do have a bunch of young folks who still have heartburn and they have rug burn from the from the primary. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a view that I think was a mistaken view that the uh, young Sanders voters would act in 2016 the same way that Hillary Clinton's voters yeah. acted in 2008. They would come home easily. And in fact, that has not turned out to be the case. And yet, what you're seeing now is a millennial surge. When you look at Funny or Die, when you look at all the, the pop icons that are coming out, it's actually starting now to be cool to be for Hillary Clinton. And that's going to make a big but difference I, on look, Tuesday. I think that this election needs to be kept in perspective. Two months ago, it was going to be electoral disaster for Republicans. We weren't going to keep the Senate. We potentially could lose the House. Now we are going to keep the Senate unequivocally. I feel very good about that. But look at, look at, listen, hold on. But look at wow. what the states that we're competing in. Every know, single one of them is said. One that Barack Obama won twice, Florida, Ohio, North Carolina, yes, Romney got that one, but Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Michigan, yeah. Wisconsin. We have opened and widened this map like never before. So it's not just Michigan, it's North Carolina, and it's where they're putting their time and their money. They recognize that we have widened the map, they are on defense, Robbie Mook should put the fireworks away, because I think it's going to be a late night, and I think that the momentum in every single one of those states, bar none, is with Donald Trump and the Republicans. Nah. First of all, the, the Senate, that was a, a pretty uh, bold prediction. We'll see if that happens. But, 24, but, 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 but Simon, I would just say it's I equivocal. Say, this is, Let's this just is, say it's an equivocal. This is what I want to say, though. On, on your point, uh, North Carolina, perfect example. I did a story on the millennial vote in North Carolina recently, and there was no question, actually did surprise me, how much re remaining opposition there was to Hillary Clinton. And it was actually, frankly, people repeating back words of Bernie Sanders That's saying right. when people tell you how to vote don't listen to them and I said but is Bernie Sanders now telling you that it doesn't matter I want to say so, so, it, so it is residual and I do think it's kind of as we get in these final hours the fact that Donald Trump's base is coming home and his people are coming home and Hillary Clinton's having more let me ask problems. you Pam before you say that President Obama was in Fayetteville North Carolina uh, there was a nice moment where he, there was a, a, a pro-Trump supporter, and he shouted down the crowds, you know, listen to this man, respect this man, he's allowed to do it. But there's also a frustration you can hear in President Obama's voice in the crowd not listening to him. Take a look. Hey, everybody! Everybody! Hey! Hey! Listen up! Hey! I told you to be focused, and you're not focused right now! Listen to what I'm saying! <laughs> Hey, he's not just talking about that protester there, is he, Van? <laughs> well, he's not, but let me just say two things about that that was so amazing. First of all... He's not running. I'm just saying, <laughs> but just, but there's something beautiful about, about that. He was yelling because he wanted the protester, the dissenter, to be respected. Right. Not punched, not right. drug out of here on a stretcher. And, and so I think that's very, very important. The other thing is, can you imagine what would have happened if that crowd had gotten out of control? with the President of the United States standing right there if something bad had happened. And so there's a desperation there, I think, also to make sure that nothing bad happened um, on his watch. I think with regard to that, I think the way he handled that was was very respectful. Pointing out the fact this was an elderly man, he was a veteran, and, a veteran. and we need to show respect. I thought that was uh, very good. But clearly he's uh, frustrated with the fact he doesn't have control. And, and in addition to that, this week, many of the speeches and interviews he's been giving is reminding folks, millennials and all, and all if you vote for Donald Trump, you're basically handing away my legacy. Everything that I have accomplished and done as president, he has vowed to take away. So he is not really being able to pr promote and tout Hillary's favorables, but tout and, and criticize Donald Trump because he is going to lose his legacy. And that's really his message. There is frustration out. among Democrats, and it seems from President Obama that African-American turnout is not where it was for him in 2012 and 2008. That it's that it's it's lagging. Surprise! Which, I mean, I, to advance point, I don't think uh, the Clinton campaign was ever, ever counting on African-American turnout 
turn out to be at the levels it was uh, for the first African American president. Uh, and in fact, I think what you're seeing is, uh, I think we need to see what happens on Tuesday. The Latino vote may end up being a That's critical part of the storyline on Tuesday night. Uh, if it if it really does increase as it's over, uh, Latinos make up a much bigger share of the pie than they did four years ago. And it's one of Hillary Clinton's strongest groups in that Obama coalition. That may make up for a dip in the African American so, vote. So I just want to come back at you on the, the lack of enthusiasm. Just take two states. I mean, North Carolina, you all have been reporting that the African American vote was down. Why, is, why was it down initially? It was because of voter suppression, that they closed down 17 counties, closed down sites, shortened hours. There was this purging of African, largely African American votes. Now, though, over the weekend, they have seen an incredible spike. And so in 2012, Barack Obama got 23% of the African-American early vote. And here, now, it's 20, this is before all of the numbers are in from yesterday, it's 22.3% in North Carolina. In Florida, the numbers are up. You guys have been reporting that the numbers were down since 2008. But since 2012, the African-American numbers are up 22%. Hold so, on, so, but, but, but like, okay, so you brought up So I'm just saying, and, and, and Latin. Let me just finish my point on the Latino vote in Florida up 120 percent. So, bottom line is that new America is really showing up for Hillary Clinton. Sean, Sean, uh, unfortunately, oh, I'm so job, sorry. Jen. Governor, <laughs> mission accomplished for the governor. I'm so sorry. Who will win the White House based on who wins the World Series? What the Cubs win might mean for election night. That's nice. State of the Union is brought to you by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation.